After the rise of fascist and communist dictatorships in the 1930s and 1940s, an economist named Friedrich Hayek wrote a text known as The Road to Serfdom. Unlike Keynesian economists, who believed that government spending was capable of rescuing a nation full of economic troubles, Hayek believed that the commanding heights, a term used by Lenin to describe increasing government economic control, would eventually result in common, everyday citizens being reduced to a world of serfdom. Over time, Hayek theorized that the government would destroy competition from competing private industry in favor of advancing itself. Once the economic rights of a citizen were gone, it was only a matter of time before the political rights followed. As I read this text by Hayek, I started to think about the past of a country that actually experienced serfdom and in historical terms relatively recently, Tsarist Russia. If Hayek is correct in his theory that collectivization and centralized control are the bedrock on the road to serfdom, then what is the foundation for the road away from serfdom? Every year I talk about abolitionism, and I created an entire video on how the process of abolitionism developed in America titled, The Roots of Abolitionism. Let's take a look at how the idea of emancipation develops overseas in a different country, and how it compares with the United States' path toward emancipation. In case it wasn't already obvious, the goals of this video today are to examine the factors that led to the end of serfdom in the Russian Empire, and to compare those factors to those from the development of the abolition movement in America. To understand the basis of comparison to American slavery, we need to really go back over a description of what the status of serfdom really meant in Tsarist Russia. The status of the serfs in Russia links much to the history of the nation itself. One thing anyone trying to understand Russia needs to examine is the country's relationship to Europe. As a country that straddles both Europe and Asia, Russia is a true syncretic culture of Eastern and Western influences. Throughout its history, Russia has always borrowed practices from the West, but still retains a somewhat distinct identity from European nations. In the 1100s, one of the systems that the state that then occupied Russia, the Kievan Rus, decided to borrow from Europe was the system of serfdom. Serfdom was a system where peasants, or lower class people, worked the agrarian properties of nobles, or the upper class of society. While early variations of the system allowed more mobility for serfs, the destruction of the early Russian state, the Kievan Rus, by the Tatars, a group of people akin to the Mongols, made serfdom a far more permanent fixture in Russian society. During this period of devastation, serfs became ever more reliant on the nobles for protection, as they were displaced from their homes in more rural areas. Once the nobility and the monarchy, the beginning of the Tsarist Romanov dynasty, re-established control over the area, they decided to tighten control over the lower class so that should external threats appear again, there would always be a consistent reservoir of manpower that the nation could draw upon to defend itself. Over time, serfs continually lost their mobility, and by 1649, the serfs were tied to the land in a way that was not entirely dissimilar to American slavery. By law, serfs were required to stay on the land of the property owners. The Russians held on to serfdom for years, and with the success of the Russian state in the 1700s, culminating in the defeat of Napoleon in the early 1800s by Tsar Alexander I, most of the ruling classes saw no reason to change things. Russia was riding high as a country that was able to defeat arguably the most powerful European army of the era, and seized recognition as a worldwide power. However, as I've always argued, the early 1800s was a turning point for nations all around the world. In a world of change, the backward systems of Russian serfdom and American slavery would have no place. The road away from serfdom was beginning to be built, starting with the economic issues of the day. In the late 1700s, a movement came that would shake the foundations of the entire world. This movement was called industrialization. To completely oversimplify the whole process, one of the most immediate consequences of industrialization was the conversion of many of the most arduous physical tasks of manual labor to being completed by machines. While Russia remained largely agrarian, influences from industrial Europe trickled into the country, fomenting ideas for change. While few in Russia recognized it at the time, there were some philosophers, like Boris Chicherin, who began to believe that the entire system of serfdom was holding Russia back technologically and economically. 
With that said, these forward-thinking economists needed to be careful. There was no freedom of speech in Russia. And these economists also needed proof beyond just their claims that serfdom was detrimental to Russia economically, which, by the way, they were later rectified by more current studies. According to some present-day researchers, Russia would have been about twice as rich by 1913 compared to what it actually was had Russia abolished serfdom in 1820 instead of 1861. With that said, the economic arguments against serfdom were not present in Russia in the same way that economic arguments against slavery were present in the United States. There was nothing equivalent to the northern U.S. and Russia who wanted antiquated systems of servitude gone to make way for the modern world of industry. Most Russian nobles and upper-class citizens still believed in the economic and societal value of serfdom. Russian industrialists recognized that serfdom was holding the nation back, but there were just too few of them to change the way that things were. Although certainly not to the extent of the abolitionist movement of America, some Russians had moral qualms about the system of serfdom. Unlike in American slavery, it was difficult to argue as the Russian nobility that being racially different justified the keeping of workers in servitude. Though ironically enough, some tried. Some Russian nobles argued that serfs' bones were black, not white, in a very bizarre attempt to racially differ themselves and their serfs. With that said, small reforms were made by Tsarist regimes to try to improve life under serfdom over time since it was generally recognized that serfdom was a physically exhaustive endeavor. In 1797, Tsar Paul I, great name by the way, passed a law limiting Barshina, forced work without pay, to three days a week. In 1803, reforms were passed that allowed nobles to free their serfs. While neither of these reforms caught on against the argument of necessity for the most part, they still demonstrate some compassion toward the interests of serfs trapped in the system. One key difference between American slavery and Russian serfdom is that unusual cruelty toward serfs was still punishable under law. While American slave owners could be informally punished by becoming community pariahs when they mistreated their slaves, excessive cruelty to serfs was punishable in a legal sense. While nobles were not always or even commonly punished for the mistreatment of serfs, the fact that they could be is an important difference between Russian serfdom and American slavery. The most infamous story of serf mistreatment was about a woman named Daria Saltikova, a sadistic landowner who tortured at least 38 of her serfs to death, despite the fact the nobility did not officially have the right to execute their serfs. In 1762, Saltikova was imprisoned for her heinous crimes. American slaves were never afforded such a luxury against cruel owners in the United States. Nevertheless, such cases were few and far between. As to the legality of allowing serfs freedom, only 1.5% of nobles freed their serfs after the 1803 declaration. A moral argument was not sufficient to destroy serfdom as a labor system. The Russians needed more clear evidence than just moral degradation to prove that serfdom was hurting the country. This evidence was provided with the conclusion of the Crimean War. In 1853, many in Russia believed that the West was passing them by. In an attempt to gain power in an economically important region in the world and to compete in the great game of imperialism, Russia invaded the Ottoman Empire. Unfortunately for Russia, other European powers, specifically Britain and France, recognized what Russia was doing and had their own imperialist designs for the Ottomans. Britain and France backed the Ottoman Empire and fought against Russia. Within three years, in 1856, the conflict was over, with Russia suffering a major loss in prestige on the world stage. The days of Alexander I walking triumphantly through Paris were at an end. Russia finally received a wake-up call, and just in time for a young, new, energetic leader, Alexander II. The time for emancipation had finally arrived. In 1856, Alexander II met with the Russian nobles. He discussed emancipation of the serfs frankly, stating the view of many of his advisors. If serfs were not emancipated from the top, they would emancipate themselves from the bottom. There was a lot of validity to that argument. The Tsar's secret police had advocated emancipation as early as 1839. There were 712 peasant uprisings from 1824 to 1854. On February 19, 1861, 
The Tsar announced the emancipation of the serfs. Finally, the era of serfdom was over. Well, sort of. The end of serfdom was less of a total acquiescence to peasant demands and more of a negotiated agreement between the nobles and the Tsar. The Tsar required that the nobles give up their land and split it among themselves and their former serfs. However, most serfs ended up in a system akin to sharecropping in the American South following the Civil War. While a few serfs improved their lives, many more remained in crushing debt to the villages where they were now beholden to pay their taxes. In addition, the nobles were being paid to relinquish control over the land that the peasants were now getting, increasing an already large wealth gap between the upper and lower classes. To make matters worse, the nobles usually gave their former serfs the land of the worst quality for growing crops. This put the newly emancipated peasantry in an even worse position as they were already struggling to pay the amount that was being demanded by the Russian government in taxes. So a vicious cycle was forming here where basically the peasants needed to grow crops in order to make money to pay back their taxes, but their land was so poor in quality that they struggled to grow crops. This was not helped in any way by the instability of the Russian government in the mid to late 1800s. In 1881, the Tsar who had announced emancipation, Alexander II, was killed. His son, Alexander III, was far more autocratic and conservative when it came to social issues. Alexander II's death made reform from the top very, very unlikely, barring a revolution. Since there was no reform happening from the top, the terrible system designed for debt collection continued. To recoup the money that they had spent on the nobles, buying them out of their land, the Russian government was taxing the peasantry. The debt that was being collected from the peasantry was supposed to be collected over a 49 year period from 1861 onward. Obviously, the peasants were having trouble paying this debt, and it wasn't until 1905 that the government finally forgave this debt. Not exactly a coincidence, since there was a revolution in 1905. This revolution caused then Tsar Nicholas II to abdicate some of his power to the Russian Duma, which was a new legislative body made up of, or supposed to be made up of, nobles who would cut into the absolute power of the Russian Tsar. Now, I know I've been pessimistic so far about all the effects of the emancipation of the serfs, but there were actually a lot of positives to the emancipation as well. Multiple studies have found that there were many positive effects on the living standards of the peasants. As measured by the height of draftees into the Russian army, peasants became 1.6 centimeters taller on average, indicating better nutrition. There were also surprising increases in grain production that were achieved after the emancipation as well. Peasant mortality also decreased by 5.6 deaths per thousand people. To be forewarned, I'm about to butcher the names of these researchers. But according to Andrei Markovich and Ekaterina Zervaskaya, the results of their studies indicate that serfdom was one of the most humanitarian reforms of all time. Beyond just humanitarian reforms, emancipation did encourage industrialization. In the average Russian province, industrial output increased by 60%, and industrial employment more than doubled as a result of the abolition of serfdom. Despite all this progress, it was only a couple of generations before the Tsarist regime was totally destroyed. The destruction of serfdom didn't happen early enough to keep Russia from sliding into one of the most violent regimes in world history. We've already done this throughout the video on a couple of occasions, but let's make the comparison between Russian serfdom and American slavery very direct. Similarities between Russian serfdom and American slavery were, both were tied to the land, both did not have a choice of leaving the place they were born into, both were treated horribly by the people who were in charge of them. Those who advocated for their freedom advocated in similar ways. Philosophers quibbled between total abolition and a graduated path to freedom. Emancipation became an issue in the countries around the same time, the 1860s, it took a war to kill each respective system, and the adherents of the system justified their system with similar inaccurate beliefs that slavery and serfdom were humanitarian and helpful to those who were kept in bondage. With that said, there are also some significant differences in the two systems. Historians highlight the fact that unlike slaves, serfs were not legally property. It was not in the power of a landowner to do as they pleased with a serf, though many serfs were mistreated. Researcher Alexander Pizokov 
sorry for the horrible mispronunciation, explains that serfs had rights, albeit limited. Slaves were legally property. Another key difference was that peasants did have land where they could work without supervision and could keep some of the products from the work that they did. Slaves were not able to keep what they worked for. While serfs could harvest some of the food they grew, slaves were not allowed to keep any of the cotton that they harvested. There are also differences on how slavery and serfdom ended. Slavery took an entire civil war in the United States, and while Crimea was a conflict that served as an impetus for emancipation, the effect was a little less direct. All emancipation took for Russia was a leader's decree. The U.S. required a violent separation. Last, the racial differences between slaves and serfs led to different legacies for each institution. The cultural differences post-emancipation added to the difficulties that faced the former slaves following emancipation. Though both systems were systems of forced labor, former serfs had a much better shot at getting an education from the upper class or for owning property than former slaves did. Russia and America, two countries that found themselves as adversaries over the course of the 20th century and even still in many conflicts today. However, in examining the past of both countries and their oppressive systems of labor, we find many similarities. Should we ever find ourselves in Hayek's nightmarish world, we have two roads away from serfdom that we may have to travel down, regardless of whether we follow the example of emancipation from Russia or America. With that said, it's a heck of a lot easier to travel down that road than it is to forge a path back up from it. Here's to hoping that countries with oppressive systems of labor find their own roads away from serfdom, and that those of us who have already gone down that road never need to revisit it again. <laughs>